What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Datadash and today is February 13th of 2023. Well folks, I hope you all are having a fantastic day wherever you are because in today's video, I wanna spend some time to talk about three major chart categories that are signaling warning signs. Not only are cryptocurrencies starting to give us some warning signs that further downside could be coming over the next week or so, but on top of that as well, that we've got some serious signs going on in equity markets and the broader macro indicators. We've got a lot of things to dive into in today's video. Let's go ahead and kick it off. If you guys enjoy it, drop a like. It's one of the best ways you can support the channel. Okay, let's go ahead and kick off the rambling. So starting off here with our typical Bitcoin analysis, also diving into Ethereum here in a few moments, we can already see that our favorite trend indicator is starting to signal a turn to the downside as we've seen time and time again after relief rallies. When we start to get this kind of red hue building up here, this is usually the sign that further downside is coming. And so far throughout this entire bear market, we've always flushed down to new lows. The big thing that I want you guys to note is that we are far away from those previous lows, from the recent rally that we've had in January. So we've got a good way to go down here if we are gonna be setting a new lows. But at the same time, I want you guys to realize that when I'm talking about price coming back down to this low range, I'm not saying it has to go to 10K, I'm not saying it has to go to one of those lower levels that we've maybe talked about in the past. We really, most throughout this cycle, I think over the past year, most of 2022, once we realized it was a bear market, we focused on the 14K range, and that's about what we've gotten so far. But we are open to the idea that this could possibly come down to 12, 13,000. And if we were to get to that kind of price, range and we started to see some buyers after a wave of capitulation that's where i would start to get really interested and it's why again if you want a dollar cost average you can do so slowly and steadily and get more aggressively during those capitulative candles that's the best way you usually approach it if you're not going to wait until a clear trend reversal and you're willing to wait it out so to speak i think that this could be a slow drag on where we come back down into this lower band here of descending support. And from there, we might get some really good value opportunities. I'm not eager to pay a premium here and buy when momentum fades like this so quickly. And there might be, sure, a little bump up back here towards 22 or 23,000. I'll come back to that point a little bit later on. Same with equities. But again, if we're starting to set lower highs and lower lows, that's a sign that the trend is weakening, that this was likely a mere relief rally like we saw back in August and like we saw back from January to March of 2022. Another key sign that's telling me this is what's going on with Ethereum. The momentum indicator for both Ethereum's dollar chart as well as its BTC chart, which is more important in my opinion, are signaling weakening signs of momentum. Since back in January, the ETH USD dollar price continued to climb up, had a good positive blue signal of momentum like we saw back in July, and that has since faded since Bitcoin started to roll over from around $1,700 down to $1,500 for Ethereum. The ETH to BTC ratio, even more concerning, whether looking at the daily or weekly time frame, the ETH to BTC ratio, meaning ETH's performance against that of Bitcoin, is showing signs of weakness. Nothing too shocking right now, to be completely candid, generally within the range we've been in throughout the later part of January. But we're not making higher lows and higher highs, all of which would be indicative signs that risk taking is on and people are getting more confident. What's more concerning is that over the past month, since really back in early January, we've continued to move generally lower here on the ETH to BTC ratio. And we've already been in what may very well be a massive distribution pattern since as far back as 2021. So again, I would advise caution buying Ethereum at these levels, because we not only expect that Bitcoin will roll over here, but that it's gonna be worse for Ethereum. Again, I, I really can't emphasize that enough. If you guys look at any prior cycles, if we just go to the monthly chart, what Ethereum has seen so far, and I'll go ahead, I'll turn off the indicator here so you guys can properly see it on the chart of the log scale, right? Ethereum usually goes through much broader pullbacks. If we go ahead and use the percentage decline tool from top to bottom, you can see in the last cycle that Ethereum went down roughly 95%, whereas this time around, from the previous relative low of this bear market, we only went down around 81.5%, roughly speaking. So again, as we've emphasized in the past, the difference between a, say, 90% correction versus an 80% from top to bottom 
is massive. Do not negate the difference here, because if you need to simply put it into visual perspective, you can see just how much of a difference that is when you consider that the fact is that an 80% correction roughly is around a little under $1,000 for Ethereum's price. And if we were to take it to around 90%, you're talking about $467. If you take it towards the typical correction range of around 94% from the last bear market, that takes us all the way below $300 for Ethereum's price. I'm not saying that's a guarantee. I'm just saying perhaps the market's getting too confident and oh, let's just dollar cost average. Let's just buy into the leading players. Folks, this is a different type of market correction. Considering the macro environment, considering the change in liquidity flows, I have a feeling that this is not only the kind of sideways consolidation that leads towards lower price levels. I think we're heading a lot lower than many people may think for some of the more risk on plays like Ethereum which really aren't seeing any major innovative plays in the DeFi space, which for me has felt like it's been stagnated for the past year or two, even when times were still good. The same ideas circulating around time and time again. I'm looking for new market leaders. I'm not interested so much in Ethereum here. I'm interested in new plays that could disrupt it, which we'll talk a little bit about later on. Another thing I wanted to talk about is one of the exclusive charts we shared within the Dash report. This month in the article, we focused on a really big talking point, and that was the Fed liquidity trap. And you guys know I don't want to just paywall everything. We talked about it to a good degree here on the channel, but we went into more extensive detail in our newsletter here on the channel, which you guys can access in the link down below in the description. And this was one of the charts we shared, the FANG liquidity trap. We talked about the dynamic of supply and demand zones and essentially where price generally faces resistance due to the fact that this is a general price range where people offload large amounts of shares in these companies and also where we can find demand where in this case buyers outweigh sellers. And we talked about how over the next month, as we go into February, as we go into the FOMC meeting, that we're not trying to bet against the Fed. And the euphoria that follows is likely an opportunity to go short or an opportunity to take advantage of the optimism, sell existing positions so you can ideally reduce some of the losses or maybe some of your long term holdings. And names like Meta or Amazon, this was a huge opportunity to do so. But also taking advantage of potentially shorting it. Now, as you can see here, we believe that this could last for a little while. We could have some chop here. This could go into March before we really start seeing the downward moves, getting a lot of people to be suckered into the idea that, oh my gosh, this is the time. This is the new bull market. It's how it always plays out, folks. If you need to look at it, simply zoom out and see that after a quarter of price remaining within this range, like back in June, and July, 2018, like in January of 2020 and to March of 2020, or back here between April to September of 2022. It can trick a lot of people into thinking that the bear market is over. It's time to go long. It doesn't always play out that way. In fact, it usually plays out the opposite way, taking advantage of people who are falling into the emotions uh, and believing that just simply because price is pushing sideways, that the market sell off is over. We believe we're heading much lower. And if you guys want to continue to get access to these kind of really detailed charts and all types of different insights that we don't share here on the channel, you guys can check out the dashboard. It's a great way to support the channel. You guys can get a major discount signing up for an annual subscription. And you also get access to some of our leading indicators here that we utilize to spot momentum. So definitely consider checking that out if you guys are interested. The other key leading technology chart that I think signals just as much of a warning sign is when we step out of the FANG stocks, which is Meta or previously Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, while those companies are very important and they do hold a large weight in the technology plays in the overall technology sector, what I'm really interested in as well are the titans. I'm talking about Microsoft and Apple. And if we simply look at a conjoined index between these two giants, we can see that yet again, it looks like we've deviated above the 200 day moving average, giving everyone the confidence that, oh my gosh, it's the new bull market. We cleared through the 200 day time to go all in. And as retail liquidity and retail speculation for that matter have peaked, we can see that there is a distribution window. People are selling 
into that euphoria. Institutions are weighing down that momentum and they're gonna continue to do so into the 200 day and below because they have a major advantage here of selling versus where they could have sold over the past couple months. They've likely, if you're talking about the institutional traders, been buying exactly when everyone is planning to short. And that's always when we come near the 200 week because everyone's extremely bearish when we get there and everyone's extremely euphoric and it's time to take advantage yet again of the emotional crap. Haven't we been here before? chart says so. The chart tells us that this is the typical relief rally where we deviated below the 200 day, we come back above it, everyone's excited, and then sooner or later, I'm not going to say it's going to be today or tomorrow, right? But generally speaking, in the next week or two, we're probably going to go right back down below that 200 day. And every single time we go below that 200 day, we set in new lows. And last time, we were barely holding on by a thread to that 200 week. Now it looks like we're going to be going below the 200 week this time around. We might finally get the real recessionary flush. And who knows if you, again, are not so confident that we're going to get such a bad sell off, then, you know, at least wait until we come down into that 200 week, right? And buy where, as we can see, where we saw investors buying last time, right? Again, I can't give you guys direct financial advice, but again, at a minimum, if you believe that that range is where price is going to bottom out because we had three retests there, that's fine. I would at least recommend just waiting for that there or at least dollar cost averaging more aggressively when there are those signs of capitulation, when everyone is considering going short and that the market is broken, that's when it's time to do the opposite usually. But again, these names, I wanna make it very clear why they are cash rich tech giants, they may not be the safe place they used to be. Last but not least, I want to go ahead and talk about our three macro indicators, the dollar index, the VIX, and the U.S. Treasury yield for the two-year note. Let's just go ahead and take a look at these guys because they are continuing to move higher. We've got blue flips here on momentum. I want to see a couple more days of confirmation before I get too confident of that. But we came into the five-year long increasing line of volatility support. Again, just taking a look at the uh, not so much price action, but the VIX over time, continuing to set in these higher bases, continuing to hold up here in the month of February of 2023. The U.S. two-year yield on the daily has held its longest blue rotation, right, since really back here in December. And it's looking like it's got the confidence to have the longest blue streak of momentum here on our key momentum indicator since back on the start of August. This is again a likely sign that the Fed is going to continue the tightening, that the market has overpriced the easing that the Federal Reserve is gonna do. When in reality, the Fed could continue to increase by 25 basis points time and time again until the job is done. And that the target rate is much higher than previously expected. Outside of that as well, the dollar index having its longest blue flip since back uh, in the period of August of 2020. Again, similar signs here. People have oversold the dollar here on expectations that the Fed is going to alleviate and that other central banks are gonna catch up. I gotta tell you guys, I think those people who think that way have got another thing coming. The Federal Reserve still has a job to do. Inflation is not done, it is sticky, it can come back within a month's notice, and we are already starting to see that within the car market. We're seeing that with properties still remaining relatively elevated, and we're still seeing it in regards to actual commodity prices. Take a look at some of the commodities that no one's watching. Some of the ones we watched back a couple videos ago, and you'll see not just gold and silver have been on a rally. You'll see that a whole range of energy commodities are starting to slow in their selling pace. But on top of that, everyday commodities like wheat, soy, all types of things like lumber are really starting to see a kick up copper as well holding up relatively strong and commodities moving higher means a stronger dollar here. It's going to mean the dollar is going to outpace other currencies as the Fed has to continue contracting and tightening liquidity and therefore constricting the available supply of dollars on the open market, driving the dollar index or Dixie even higher. It's the name of the game, folks, and we have to know when that momentum signal is switching and be able to trade with the trend, i.e. to be long the dollar, to be long commodities, and short the broader asset markets, if we are to take any positions. But it always makes sense as well to potentially be in cash and wait out for some of the big opportunities. And that's what I wanna spend some time to talk about during today's sponsor news mention, which is about our partner Radix DLT. 
Now, if you guys haven't been following Radix, it's one of the long-term projects we've been tracking. I've been following Radix as far back as 2018. They would have been one of our long-term partners over the past, uh, really, I think last year and a half here on the channel. It's amazing how fast time has flown. But Radix is an incredibly exciting layer one protocol in the crypto space. It's one of the few projects that I'm genuinely interested in in the event that we're going into the next bull market in the coming years because of how radically different Radix is and its approach to building a layer one built specifically for decentralized finance, not only to scale, but also to scale in regards to the network of developers, the types of applications that can be built. And I really want to talk about how you guys can get involved in potentially becoming a developer in the Radix ecosystem. Now, Radix has a native programming language called Scripto. And to just kind of send a signal here as to how valuable Scripto is as a language, I'm gonna put it this way. There are two leading software innovations that have me genuinely excited going into 2023, even with all of the negative macro sentiment. One of them obviously being ChatGBT, leading the way forward for OpenAI in the space of artificial intelligence and changing the way we live our daily lives. But on top of that, Scripto, the native programming language of the Radix network, it's right up there with ChatGPT because I'm very passionate about crypto, but I really have looked hard to find opportunities that have the availability to completely disrupt the crypto space. And the only one out there that has me excited is crypto. Being completely blunt with you guys, if you haven't tried messing around with crypto yet, you may be missing out on one of the biggest disruptive opportunities in the cryptocurrency industry in the last decade. And the reason why is because while everyone is still learning Solidity, trying to build within the complex developer environment of Ethereum, where you can continuously trip up by having smart contract exploits, not being able to audit 10,000 lines of code to do a set of simple functions that could be reduced into just a couple hundred lines of code on the Radix network. That is what's causing a lot of the friction point for people getting into development. Not to mention the languages themselves are much more difficult to get started with. And that's why Radix is so beneficial. There's all types of different powerful things. The fact that Scripto as a language is asset oriented, it's based on a popular language, Rust, which a lot of developers are starting to pick up and has a lot of market value. And on top of that, you can actually monetize directly on top of the blueprints or code that you're creating. Now, one of the things that I think helps people to really get a grasp on Scripto is understanding the scale of efficiency that it brings for developers. And what's great is that there's all types of different resources to where you can start learning about Scripto, but the way that I find to be very helpful is to simply get an understanding of some of the example projects on GitHub that have already been built. You can dive into the DeFi folder and find all types of different features like an auto lens service, a basic flash loan service, or more specifically, Radiswap, which was one of the first actual demos of Scripto that showcased just how simple it can be to build a alternative to Uniswap or a simple automated market maker. And it's incredible to see just how little code is required to build something similar to Uniswap. Within less than 200 lines of code, you're able to build an equivalent to Uniswap v2. Or to put it simple, the traditional Uniswap v2 code had thousands upon thousands of lines of code with the concern of smart contract exploits along the way, which simply isn't the case when it comes to Radix. This is a major transformation in the way that development is done. Now, if you guys are interested, I highly recommend you guys get started with the introduction to Scripto documentation that you can find on the Radix website, and I'll leave a link down below in the description. But on top of that as well, check into the recent grants program that's gone live here in the month of February, where you guys can see some of the major development projects out there. It might be that you want to join one of these projects that are getting support from the Radix ecosystem, or you might want to prepare for the upcoming secondary grants program in Q2. There's lots of ways to get involved, ways to not only get financial support, but get the resources you need and the guidance to actually build a successful and valuable protocol in the Radix ecosystem. Again, Scripto, and ChatGPT. Those are the two things that I'm interested in right now. If you guys aren't getting tapped into how to use these technologies, you may be missing a really big opportunity. They're things that even as myself, I'm not a programmer by heart. I've done some data analytics and a little bit of data science back in the day, but I'm really not good with programming languages. And I think that this is a period of time where learning how to utilize exciting languages like Scripto to build valuable applications or using ChatGPT 
to act as an efficient assistant in whatever you're doing, whether it's development or writing, is going to give you leaps and bounds of advantages in the workspace and in the overall economy versus other peers. It's very, very important to keep ahead of the curve when it comes to innovation. But that being said, everyone, that's it for today's video. If you guys enjoyed it, consider dropping a like, consider subscribing if you haven't already, and hitting the bell icon so you don't miss another video here on the channel. But that being said, everyone, have a wonderful rest of your day, and I'll see you all in the next one. Take care, everyone.